All right, so we got ourselves our uh, horse-drawn buggy over here. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure the horses are running properly, you know? Sometimes it seems like the poop's not quite coming out the way it should. So, here we got ourselves a Jeep Cherokee with an empty pod. Can't have empty pods, especially with a stroker. So, today it's time to fill it. Up for install today is a wonderful AEM wide band oxygen sensor and gauge install. So this is the X series. This is the cream of the crop, fancy new fangled technology. Take a look at this, huh? So this here is a wide band oxygen sensor gauge or a universal, what's it called? A U Uego or something, a universal exhaust gas sensor something like that it, it's basically a fancier oxygen sensor it, it shows you um a full sweep it's it's laboratory grade it, it gives you an actual number instead of just a goofy a goofy voltage that kind of represents somewhere around um stoichiometric uh but the reason why you'd want something like this is for keeping an eye on your engine especially when you're doing tuning and stuff like that you want to make sure that you're within spec because when you start messing with injectors and engine size and tunes and stuff like that, you want to make sure you're not running too rich or too lean or you just want to see what the heck the thing's doing. Well, this is it. So, this whole kit is a gauge. And first off, look at how thin this thing is. That is the entire unit. This is a ga an electronic gauge and controller for the wideband sensor. So, I guess we'll get right into the sensor. This right here is our wideband oxygen sensor. So, it'll give us a voltage... Um, the gauge is needed to actually run this thing. You can't just hook this up. You need some kind of controller to run the gauge, uh, to run the sensor. So it'll plug into the back here, and this will take care of all the dirty work to get the sensor's uh, readings. And then from this, we can also get uh, analog outputs so that we can log it and, uh, you know, just check it out on the screen and stuff like that. But yeah, it looks just like a, uh, you know, a narrow band, but it's a little fancier. We got like six plugs in here. Now, the cool thing with this new setup is uh, this does not require free air uh, calibration anymore. Uh, inside, I forget if it's in the connector or somewhere somewhere around here, there is an integrated uh, resistor uh, value. Maybe it's that right there. Is that the resistor value? 17 or 1,700 ohms? But all of these are tuned with uh, embedded resistors now, laser engraved or something like that, so that they are set up uh, really ready to go uh, out of the factory. So you don't have to calibrate them anymore like the old style. Now, we get uh, this pigtail, which is for our power and uh, data lines, if you're interested in data. And then this is the extension harness that connects the, uh, the sensor to our gauge. And then we got a couple other things. So we have our, our exhaust bung, we got some, uh, some wire clamp thingies, and a rubber band <laughs> to uh, fit your, your actual gauge. But yeah, this is the, the whole setup right here, is uh, this guy. And, uh, yeah, it is a 52 millimeter or, what is it, a 2 and 1 16th inch? Whatever, like, the basically the standard size is. So let's take that out so I can show it, though. Let's see it real quick. So why the heck would you want a wideband sensor? Why can't you just use a narrow band? Well, uh, first off, if the name doesn't quite describe it, uh, the wideband oxygen sensors are designed more for actually monitoring the system, whereas a narrow band is really only there to give the uh, engine, uh, to give the computer an idea of where it's at. So with the narrow band, what it does is it focuses on right at the cusp, right where that dividing line is. At, you know, for gas, it'd be 14.7, 14.65 if you want to get accurate. But what the engine is doing is uh, it'll look for the narrow band and it'll, it'll run a little rich and it wants to see the sensor go high. And if it's high, it knows that it's too rich. So then it'll bring it back down low. And then once it crosses that narrow threshold and it starts to re-lean, it's like, okay, it knows where it's at. So the goal is to make the sensor keep bouncing back and forth to know exactly where it's at. And, you know, for the older system, that's great, you know, when it works. But for this Renix business, oh, man, it has a hard time getting the sensor to cooperate properly and run. And it's just a pain in the ass. It keeps wanting to fall out of closed loop. And it's just, oh, we're going to do some fun things with this later. I'm going to try and use this as a tuner. And oh, you'll see. Arduinos, man, they're so fun. But with the wideband, instead of just getting that narrow little pass, you get an entire range 
and it's a it's linear too with the with the narrow band it'll you'll you'll see the thing and it goes whoop and that's pretty much it whoop with this guy it's a sweep all the way across so, i mean even if you look at this it goes from you know a lamp, uh you know an air fuel of 8 to 20 which is you know crazy usually the narrow bands are a lot smaller it'd be like you know i'm just kind of guessing here but like 13 to 15 if you're lucky so you get you you just you know you get a lot more range a lot more accuracy it, and uh these things have really fast response time this is like one of the fastest responding sensor kits out there so yeah this is cream of the crop stuff right here um i guess you guys want a number don't you okay so in case you're curious this is the gauge kit right here it is 300 so that is this x series uego gauge kit all right so now that we got the technical crap out of the way the it's got like a little a little recess on there on that cup and that recess is what fits in there so it'll stick out a bit it'll stick out a bit but uh i actually have to trim this a little bit for some reason it's not a perfect circle so it doesn't want to freaking fit uh if your hole's a little loose that's what that rubber band is for the rubber band is there to give you a little extra friction in case you don't stick but yeah when it when it sets uh, you know when we when we get our hole trimmed it'll sit in there some something like that so it sticks out a little bit but whatever and with the the things on the back you could also do some kind of flush mount or something like that so if you wanted to put it somewhere or buy a pod or something like that you can do that they look really snazzy so i'm sure you could find a spot to put it if you needed you know something like that would be kind of cool all right so we'll worry about that when we worry about that for now we are going to have to mount the sensor somewhere and that's what this bung is for it's a weld in bung it's basically just a threaded insert and you drill a hole in the exhaust and weld that in place uh, it is recommended that you install this 18 inches away from your exhaust port and uh, you want to make sure that you are before any catalytic converters and stuff like that because obviously after the cats that affects your reading so coming down in here we can see our exhaust pipe so this is custom two and a half inch exhaust that I got going everywhere. Um, and if we measure from like, you know, the middle of the exhaust ports down about where this narrow band sensor is sitting is about 18 inches. So somewhere around that region, uh, somewhere around here, we'll uh, be popping a hole and putting in that bung. Now they recommend that the sensor is installed higher at, at least 10 degrees above horizontal. And that's to let water drip. So basically the exact opposite of what you're seeing here. <laughs> you want the sensor to be at least 10 degrees pointing down so that any moisture falls off the sensor. So yeah, I guess we'll have to pick a spot and uh, drill and weld that bung. I don't think I'm going to have the room to get a, uh, a MIG gun in there and properly weld all the way around. So I'm thinking about taking this off. And i got to do some cutting to fit some uh, long arm stuff. So yeah, this thing might be coming off for the work that we're going to do. It should be exciting. So here's our bung over here. I just have that, you know, pressed on there for now. So obviously it's going to sit a little closer, but you want to make sure wherever you stall it, you can actually take the darn thing out later. Looking for clearance. Right about there is a nice flat spot. This should be good. Come down here. You want to make sure that it's, you know, pointing away from anything bad. That you got to be cognizant of everything that moves around and shakes. And if this isn't going to hit anything, and you can actually get tools in here to take the damn thing out if you need and stuff like that. So make sure you got your backwards room to actually install the thing and all that. So that that's looking right right good right around there. That should be fine. But if you notice the way that everything sits, that should be at about our 10 degree mark. So all right, I think that'll do. Man, that bung is a big one, so you better hope you got a 7 8 inch drill bit. That's the uh, that's the size of the smaller part of the flange, anyway. This little section right here. That is seven eighths of an inch. <laughs> so yeah, I guess we're gonna do a little pile holder and work our way up to that. But uh, Jesus, that last little quarter inch is a right pain in the ass to finally get that thing to work. But she's in there now, so we'll just have to do a little a welderoo. So uh, before we do that though, I mean obviously we're going to have to clean up the edges so we can actually have something to weld to, but uh, I'm just going to put this back in the vehicle and make sure that the sensor sits where it should. Always check, always check. 
Alright, so here's the aftermath. My wire speed wasn't up really uh, high enough, so I was getting the amperage I was needing, but I just wouldn't, wasn't putting the metal in. So, what I thought looked kind of good ended up not being enough, so I had to do a couple passes and... Eh, that part looks pretty shitty, but... This stuff over here doesn't look half bad, you know? Could pass for a low-end exhaust shot, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but I shined a flashlight in there, and I didn't see any holes, so we are sealed. Ain't the prettiest, but, you know, what are you going to do? So in case you're wondering, this is the welder I used. That was the settings I was at. This is just some flux core wire. So yeah, you two can kind of sort of put shit together. <laughs> okay, so the sensor doesn't quite win. I'm sure that there's uh, some schmoo or other crap on the, uh, the thread, so I just want to clean them out with a... Uh, a tap real quick and luckily it actually is a metric thread because I have the big old metric set I need to go get the standard one at some point uh, but the size is an 18 millimeter by one and a half so we will take this guy and run her through and make sure she's all nice the way the sensor stays okay so now we can reattach our uh, freaking downpipe and uh, yeah if you're doing any other exhaust work maybe do that before you uh, commit to welding this entire thing in because we're a little tight now. So what I'm going to do is thread the sensor in first and then we'll uh, tighten this down so we know for certain that this will fit where it needs to. So I mean we do have a little bit of wiggle room but eh. yeah. What are you going to do? Nice thing is over here we do have a little bit of anti-seize. I might do a little more but you know you want something on there. The sensor port's nice and clean. So we will thread it in there. Don't have to crank her down super tight, just enough to seal. Did you say seal? Alright, beautiful. I don't know if uh, you can see what I can see or... But we, we do have some clearance. So, we can wiggle this around a little bit and, you know, go where we need to, so... Alright, we'll uh, tighten her up now. Okay. So here's our final clearances over here. Looking good. We got enough. So I got the wire run back behind some other stuff and positioned out of the way so that it's as far away from the exhaust as possible along with everything else. So no heat, no problem. Obviously it's away from drive shafts and uh, things moving and stuff like that. So that runs all the way up there, up yonder. And we come up to here, and all the rest of it actually just tucked itself in there perfectly. So we got a couple loops into the unknown. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Beautiful. Okay, then that just goes in there, so there you go. That's all the under hood and under vehicle stuff. Beauty. Okay, so here we got our hole. And I uh, had to open it up a little bit so we can squeeze the darn thing in there. You gotta push pretty hard. Because it's still a little tight, but it does actually sit in there. So, you know she ain't falling out. <laughs> but that's what it looks like when it sits inside a pod. So it's a little big, but eh, what are you going to do? So I actually used a uh, one of these guys right here. And uh, set it at the wide point and just kept using it to shave off little bits of the plastic to figure out where the high spots were. I'm sure there's other methods, but that's what worked for me. Okay, so now that that's fit, I guess we can try and run uh, wires. So when I put this gauge pot in, there's actually a hole behind the trans gauge that goes down the plastic. You probably can't see it, but there's a pretty decent sized hole down underneath that pocket. We might have to uh, take this off a little bit to slide our connectors through, but we're gonna run that down. And then there's a giant hole kind of thing back around that corner that we can slide everything down and underneath. Okay, so step one is going to be to get some stiff wire that we can uh, use to feed down into the hole. And we're going to do a little electrical fishing. And your goal is to try to get it down at the bottom, wherever the heck you want your wires to go. So this one is a little tricky, <laughs> but it was easier for me since this was already done once before. 
So we went down in the hole, but I had to push farther to the back instead of the front to finally get it to slide through. Uh, and then you climb down here. Ooh. And where the heck are we? Come here. Okay. Mess of wires. Okay. So our wire goes here. And up there, and uh, it's hard to show you, but there is a there is a corner pocket. Uh, where the heck is it? There is a corner pocket that this will feed through. So just make sure that this is where you want it to go. Ugh. You feed it down with one hand, and then you try to grab it with the other. So now what we'll do is we'll take the end that goes to the gauge here. And we'll just give her a little electrical tape wrap, and then we'll slide that back up through the top to get it where we need it to. Okay, so now we got a little electrical tape holding this onto there. You want to make sure that it's got a little bit of a cone shape to it, so it'll easily pass through whatever you're pulling through. And you probably want to do this with two hands, most definitely with two hands. But, you know, make sure your wire is straight. It's not kinked or coiled too much. And you're just going to kind of work your way up there. You pull on this and you push on that until you uh, get to your destination. And with some careful work, you can slide it on up. Now, uh, thinking about this, I may have made a slight mistake here. Uh, because we're still going to have to fit this part through the firewall. So, we might have jumped the gun <laughs> starting here when we should have started through the firewall first and then did the interior pit. Mm. No worries though, we'll just have to pull this back through the other way and then, uh, yeah, push it through a firewall hole first. Damn. Oh well. Well that's how you do that. <laughs> Very carefully. Lots of uh, wiggling. So I constantly get questions on where to run wires through the firewall almost every single time. The main opening is going to be right down there. I don't know if you can see that. I got about a billion wires coming out of that thing. I fit so much through there, it's ridiculous. So that is your number one spot. Number two, I actually got the uh, hood release cable uh, rubber to open up. And I even squeezed a few through there. So that's another idea. But those are the two main spots that you're going to find for running wires. Otherwise, you might have to drill a hole or something and make your own grommet. All right, anyway, here's take two. If I can't jam it in through this side, then I'll go inside and give it a little tug, see if she can't squeeze on in. The uh, spot that they come out, see that gray cable? To the left of that is that section. So we're gonna run that over the steering column, in front of the brakes, uh, the brake pedal, and then over this bar, and then way up there. So I attached it, fished it back up. And here we are. So I've got both cables run through. And I got the bottom one out here because I'm just gonna run it to this gauge. Uh, it only needs a five amp fuse. So this wiring should be thick enough to support that. So on here, this is our ignition wire in the center and over here is our ground. So I'm just going to hook up our red and our black real quick to this, plug the sensor in, and we're gonna see if it works. Oh boy. Okay, so I guess I should show where that you can get power if you don't have a gauge already set up. So if you come down here into the fuse box, uh, you'll see I got a few wires going on here. That, like that red one I found was an ignition wire, the blue one up top, and that yellow one even says ignition. And then you can get uh, an inline fuse to plug into that or get a fuse expander or something like that. But if you're not sure if which ones of these are uh, ignition based, then you can turn the key on and poke around with the multimeter and see which ones get power. But that's what worked for me. And then for ground, there's a very common ground point underneath the dash. Somewhere. There we go. So that right there behind the other light is a decent ground point. So, there you go. That's where you can run your ignition and ground for your gauge. Okay, so we got our alligator clip to our red and our black. And we just got it clipped on here for our ignition and our ground. So if we did everything properly, we should get some doodly-doos. 
Hey. Okay. Okay, so it looks like it's heating up the oxygen sensor. That's cool. That's very cool. That's snazzy. So then I guess once it heats up, we can start it and see what the heck she do. Let's see if I can plug my REM in here. Oh, hey. Got a little spinny dinny. Okay, so we're reading like basically zero on our regular oxygen sensor, and this one shows this line. So let's see what happens when we start it up. Which one's lean and which one's rich? I would assume the lower is rich. I'll have to actually read into that. But cool. It actually do the things, man. Let's see if I can give it some rev without busting my ass here. Whoa! <laughs> I like that. That's awesome. Alright, well, it looks like we might be able to use this for tuning purposes. Excellent. Very nice. Okay, so you're now tethered because this phone can't last more than two fucking hours when I'm trying to film. Anyway, we've got two wire terminals on there, little eyelets, because on here we actually have two studs. So we're just gonna do that. I snipped the wires to the length that I needed. We got the red and the black. We don't need the white striped, the green striped, or the blue. The white and green are for the AEM stuff. The blue is for cereal, which I might be interested at some point. But the standard white and the standard brown are the analog. So we have our analog uh, signal, which is white, and then the analog ground, which is brown. So I'm going to plug that into the REM at some point and see if we can get some analog readings. And, you know, I might mess with the cereal, but we'll have to convert it from uh, RS-232 to UART to be able to read on the stuff I have, so, and eh, that'll be for later. But anyway, yeah, I just have that a little longer, so I'm gonna run that uh, around back so I can plug into that later. Our terminals are now installed and run through the separate pieces. So, everything is hooked up again, we got ignition, we got ground. Let's see, do she work? Yay, it works. Cool. Alright, well, we did it. So now I'm gonna run these wires around back, put this back in, and we're done. That's everything, baby. Yeah, yeah. Alright, so we got them both running. I finally got the oxygen sensor going to closed loop mode so we can see the damn thing moving. I wonder if I can uh, focus this. sensor on the REM is actually going high and low and you can see all the wideband is changing with it so if you notice a large change in the narrow band is only a small change in the wideband very cool you a little gas and we'll let off coast and gas <laughs> look at that thing go that's actually really cool well, I'm glad I got the Jeep to go into fucking closed loop so we could actually see this damn thing very cool very cool and now we even got uh, a little bit of long term change so it dropped from 128 to 127 that's nice. We can see our uh, short term 
it doesn't change nearly as much, it just goes over little tiny steps. That's badass, man. That is badass. Okay, so inside the shop, I'll show you what we got hooked up here. So here we have an REM2. This is a version 4.1, so it's got everything all mapped out. And we have a few extra goodies in here, uh, a few being 5 volt uh, voltage dividers, because the Teensies are only good to 3.3 volt. Well, a lot of older stuff still uses 5 volts, so I've actually got uh, two sets of uh, voltage dividers, the two resistors, so we can read 5 volts instead of 3. And then I just got this little guy over here, so that uh, it makes pulling the unit in and out a lot easier, so we just got a quick disconnect basically. So we got that hooked up. I'm going to see if we need the analog ground, or if the body ground is good enough. But if not, I have a, a free pin hanging off over there that we can use. Alright, so we got pin A3 soldered for a resistor divider, so that's cool. I'm going to have to do some coding math. But now, let's see what those readings mean. So, what is our 0 to 5 volt signal actually going to be? Well, here we have the PDF for whatever the heck this is, the AEM gauge. And if you notice, they actually have an analog uh, chart. So if you notice less than 5 volts, the sensor's not ready. So that's really cool. We can use that as a reading. And higher than 4.5 is a, uh, a sensor error. So that's another cool thing. So basically, we're worried about from 0.5 to 4.5. And that'll be our AFR. So... All we have to do is do some math. I'm going to chart this in Excel just to see. I'm almost completely sure this is going to be linear, just a straight line. So it'll be easy once we have our little cutoffs. Oh, actually, shit, they already have the uh, the formula for you. Oh, that's easy. Okay. So, yeah, I guess all we got to do is plug that in, and we should be good to go. Look at that. They did all the work for us. All right, so that works out. So we take our AFR reading, because that's what we care about, and dump it in here. So 0.5 volts down here equals 8.5 good and we'll test the other extreme 4.5 18 cool all right so that works so we can dump that straight into the rems code and we should have afr okay so here is the code that we have set up for this so for our display afr first off we have an analog read and we convert that read from 1024 into 3.3 because that's what the actual input is the highest that the thing can go is 3.3 volts, so it's just a simple conversion thingy to go from one value to the other. And then after that, now we have the voltage divider math. We have a 3.3K and a 2.2K. The decimal places don't matter, so we just have uh, the R1, R2 math, which is this over here. So this is for voltage dividers. You can put in what your R1 and R2 is, and uh, it'll convert the voltage into whatever the new one is. Okay, great. So now we have the voltage that we're reading in. And then we take that voltage and put it through the AFR calculation so that we can get the um, the actual AFR. And then we just print them. So we have the, the regular voltage printed and the actual AFR printed. So right now we're getting an error because it's dividing by zero. So we're going to go plug it in and see what we get. Okay, so looking back, I probably should have cut those wires a little longer, but it'll do. So you can see we got our two little pins in there. I even cut out a little spot in the case so the wires can fit through, so we can put the door on. Okay, ground wires in place, time for take two. So I dumped some of the math, so this is our raw analog input. So now we're going to watch the thing heat up. Because I checked with a multimeter and it's definitely output in voltage. So... Huh. All right, so this says like 16.7. It still says we're only getting a couple... Oh, okay, there you go. Took you freaking long enough. Now you're reading. Okay, so yeah, we do have voltage on the pin, so our math is just being goofy. For some reason, i got to figure out why it's reading infinite. Maybe I'm doing too much math in uh, one step. Okay, so now we have our freaking numbers. We have our voltage here, and we have our AFR there. So if you notice in the code, I found out that our um, our re resistor divider thing was causing an issue for some reason. So this was our, our math right here, R2 divided by R1 plus R2. So I just put in the numbers, and uh, it comes out to 0 0.6 for mine, which was uh, the 22 and the 33. So I just put that in there, and now that works perfectly fine. So we just got that divided by that, and then we have our voltage. So cool 
now I think we can actually test this damn thing out. Okay, so now the left number I have multiplied by 10, so there's not going to be a decimal. So we can see that it's reading 0 something. Okay. All right. So if you notice now, it's reading probably 4.5 because there's just no air fuel in the system. But we can see our AFR. Cool. Interesting that it's jumping around though. I wonder if the voltage is moving at all. That's quite a bit of a movement actually. All right, start it up. Oh baby. Oh, we actually have an AFR reading now. Cool. Let's see what that response time looks like. Alright. Now we're talking. So now that we have an input, now we can start working on outputs. Mmm. And let's just see that poor little oxygen sensor. Hey, it's actually moving a little bit. Wowzers. Not completely stuck. Is the thingy? Yeah, the thingy. Oh well. Okay, so now we got our wideband run idle. And I ran that, and it seemed pretty good. So now, we are going to plug this back in. I put the narrow band back in, because now I want to see what the narrow band does. Okay. So we got everything there, cool, lovely. And we'll give her a crank. Now, I... Come on. Oh, you bastard. Okay. So the interesting thing with this oxygen sensor is it starts, it starts out lean, and then runs down to rich, which is weird. But like, we're in closed loop right now. So this is the AFR uh, being mapped as compared to the oxygen sensor. So this is basically the narrow band and wide band at the same time. So we can see that's going up and down. Uh, this should be the actual sensor. Okay. It actually did jump into closed loop and it's working. You can see that um, it's pushing much farther past the boundaries because it might have been used to the narrow band a little bit. So that's interesting. But it is, it is switching back and forth. So that's very good. Cool. So we can see this one's got like a swing of like 14.3 to like almost 16 at some points. All right. And then we'll try Raising the idle. Interestingly, though, uh, we don't get a backfire with the narrow band. So I'll have to see what that's doing that the other one isn't and see how that changes. So that's, that's interesting. Here we got good old Pico again. And now we are hooked up to the blue wire. That is our RS-232 serial output. So all this does is output whatever's on the display. So when we turn this on, we should get a output. So that'll be doing its blinky dinkies. And oh look, we have things. So we are going to turn this up to 20 volts. Come on, you fuck. Work with me, baby. Why you no click skis? Hello? Please? Please, excuse me. Excuse me. Fucking beta software. Okay, so. Here is our serial output. Sweet. Let's get in there just a whole lot closer. Alright, check you out, eh? We actually got data. Back out a little more. Alright, so that should be, um... Probably, what? Three numbers and a decimal point. Cool. Alright, so we have our data... So it looks like we idle low, and we're sitting at about 10 volts. So I want to see if I can convert this into UART. 
because this is obviously RS-232. It's not negative at all, so that's really good. But let's see if we can convert this real quick, because this does have serial decoding. Okay, so here we go. We got ourselves uh, some flippy floppies, and some drippy droppies. So that is in hex, and this is in decimal. So it seems like we get fairly constant numbers. Let's see if I can stop it on a good one here. So, uh, yeah, these are all numbers, and uh, maybe they mean something. Maybe they, uh, oh, that's, I don't know what the fuck that would be. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Again, now we got to figure out the serial protocol and that stuff. It's in the manual a little bit. If we check into here, oh, yeah, derp de derp. Right. Format is simply the value, followed by carriage return and line feed. Okay, so. Okay. Ugh, let's see what we can figure out here. Bingo! Okay, I had to invert the data because uh, I guess this defaults to UART instead of uh, RS232. Interesting. So if you look, it says 99.9, .9, which makes sense because right now this is showing dashes. Cool. And the last two symbols we can ignore because, like they said, this is the slash R and slash N, so that when you're reading this into a. Uh, a serial thing it just it just shows a list that makes it space and enter and whatever the heck serial does so now if you look it just says 99.9 .9. cool all right perfecto all right so now if we start this we should see numbers that change i think everything's where it should be right nothing's gonna blow up okay go so we got numbers there Okay, so if we take a gander here at our output, it's only outputting uh, a value every 100 milliseconds. So uh, that's not really going to help uh, with what we're doing, considering we take a reading every 20 milliseconds. So in the time that we get, um, you know, what is that, five readings? We're only getting one from serial. So is it worth sitting there and building the circuit and trying to read it all in and doing all that to compare it? just to see I don't know hmm so real quick I wanted to show some of the findings uh, from the data logging so this right here is the narrowband sensor and the wideband sensor mapped together so what this is doing is it's showing the actual AFR reading of the narrowband voltage so you can see how terrible the narrowband is now before I get into this too deep uh, I need to see, I don't remember if I took these readings before or after the AFR averaging because I found out that gauge is really noisy on the analog signal so it could be adding some extra noise that's not really there. But you can see the basic line here. So as it starts out rich, it's real low, real low, don't really get much. And then right at the 14 mark is when things start to go a little higher. And it instantly goes from like a low all the way up to a high real fast. So right around 16 is when it's completely, you know, up there in the lean range. So that's that's why a narrowband sensor can't be used for much. And again, I can't completely blame the accuracy, but just look at the, the left to right, okay? So this voltage right here, 1.5 volts, could be, you know, almost 14, like 14.2, or it could be 16.2, which is the entire range. So you can't even reliably use a narrowband sensor to get AFR. But that's if, you know, the accuracy isn't messing with things. So I'll have to take another reading just to be sure. Now, all this business over here on the left is when the narrowband sensor would get stuck. So when you floor it or something like that, it would just, it wouldn't cooperate for a while. I guess it was like so rich that it just it had to burn off the fuel or something. I don't know. But this is the part that sucks. And it wouldn't actually be working, so you'd fall out of closed loop. That's the AFR versus the narrowband. And then here's a, a simpler graph with only a few things plotted, just so we can see what you know a really good proper oxygen sensor looks like when it's not all over the place. So you can see that the spread isn't nearly as bad, but you know it's still like almost <laughs> one whole uh, you know AFR reading. 
So yeah, now that we see uh, what the narrowband sensor looks like, we might be able to actually simulate it with the wideband. So that'll be an interesting video for next time, so stay tuned for that business.